The U.S. Supreme Court has overturned Roe v. Wade. What does the ruling really mean to abortion policy in the U.S.? Carrie Severino, the Judicial Crisis Network, is here with analysis. How will the court's decision affect the work of crisis pregnancy centers? Director of the Northwest Center in Washington, D.C., Susan Gallucci, will tell us. And the Speaker of the House wants to codify Roe into law. How close is she? Co-chair of the House Pro-Life Caucus, Congressman Chris Smith weighs in. And the Supreme Court ruled in favor of prayer at a public school game. Coach Joseph Kennedy is here to react to his landmark Supreme Court decision. And former ambassador at large for religious freedom, Sam Brownback, and a bishop from Nigeria is here to talk about religious freedom. The world over begins right now. Now, Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. We have an important show for you tonight. If you'd like to comment, send me a tweet. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. Lots to cover this evening. Let's begin. Shockwaves are still being felt from the Supreme Court's overturning of Roe v. Wade, holding that there is no constitutional right to abortion. Joining me to discuss this and what it means is president of the Judicial Crisis Network, Kerry Severino, and director of the Northwest Center, a crisis pregnancy center in Washington, D.C., Susan Gallucci. Ladies, thank you for being here. Kerry, I want to start with you. Uh, in his final opinion issued on Friday, Justice Sam Alito wrote that Roe and Casey were wrong and had to be overturned for this reason. We therefore hold that the Constitution does not confer a right to abortion. Roe and Casey must be overruled and the authority to regulate abortion must be returned to the people and their elected representatives. Now, uh, the Supreme Court decision doesn't really end abortion. That was the way it's been portrayed in the media, in many places. What's the story? Yeah, the real story is this puts abortion back where it was for most of American history until 1973, which is that the, the American people get to determine how they address this issue. We know that at the time of you know, the, the, by the early 20th century, that meant that in, in all states in the country, abortion was outlawed. That right. that had changed a little by the 1970s. But um, the, there's a right of people in the states to make laws regarding mm -hmm. this. And then there was also a role in cer certain circumstances for the federal government, potentially, right. as well. Okay. The courts are no doubt going to weigh in. There's that Louisiana injunction where a judge put a hold on the trigger law in my home state that would have outlawed it immediately in Louisiana. Your thoughts on what that may, will that sustain judicial review? I, I don't think or so. Survive? I think we're seeing, yeah, I think we're seeing a last ditch effort of like, oh my gosh, we can't get the Supreme Court to do what we want. Maybe we can find another court. But I think we have to be careful because we have seen state courts get very activist as well. Mm. Recently in, in Kansas, actually, the state court had basically a mini row. They decided, well, our Constitution covers this, too. It doesn't. And there's actually a constitutional amendment being mm. promoted, proposed there. But we might see other states run into that same problem. So look at what your state court is doing and make sure that those judges also are going to be faithful to that mm. state constitution. Uh, Susan, there are 26 states now that are limiting, in some cases, banning abortions. Um, it, it, some of these have already begun the process of trying to limit. Are crisis pregnancy centers ready to deal with the women who are going to really be in need of your services and explain what those services are? There's been a lot of misrepresentation of what crisis pregnancy centers do. Yes, I think they are ready because it's an expansion of the work we've been doing all along. So pregnancy centers, some are medical and they offer pregnancy tests and sonograms and so many women change their minds or continue their pregnancy because mm -hmm. they see the life growing inside right. them and they see the truth. Also, they provide what we call options counseling. So a woman's thinking about abortion. So we talk it through with her. We let her know this is what fetal development is. This is biology. This is what abortion looks like. Have you had an abortion before? What is that like for you? Why are you choosing abortion? And some like the Northwest Center where I'm the director, we also have a maternity home mm -hmm. because a lot of women are kicked out because they're pregnant. So we provide those resources. We provide them in a non-judgmental 
environment. We provide mm -hmm. them for free. I, myself, I'm a licensed clinical social worker. Mm -hmm. A lot of times people are volunteers and have a heart for that ministry, but they're professionals. Yeah. They're providing the truth. They are not, I've read a lot about dissuading. We don't dissuade women from abortion. We prevent them, we present them with the truth and mm -hmm. with the facts and to say, if you want to continue your pregnancy, there are resources to help with your rent, to help with the baby items, mm -hmm. to give you that emotional support. So we give them true options to continue mm -hmm. their pregnancy. Well, it's called being truly pro-choice. You give them the other choice. And the rap on the, on the crisis pregnancy centers is, well, you only care about that child until it's born. That is not true. I mean, I've visited a lot of these places. I've covered some of them, done events for, the, for some of these places. These women are, by and large, and mostly women, uh, are volunteers. They go out of their way to teach maternal care, uh, train the mother in, in a job, to seek jobs, and give, they, they're watching the children during the day. It's an amazing kind of untold story. And, and I think we're going to hear a lot more about it in the days ahead. Uh, I need to play this for you, Carrie. Congresswoman uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez reacted to the Dobbs ruling this way. Listen. What I believe that the president and the Democratic Party needs to come to terms with is that this is not just a crisis of Roe. Mm -hmm. This is a crisis of our democracy. The Supreme Court has dramatically overreached its authority. This is a crisis of legitimacy. Carrie, uh, first of all, are you concerned that you have Congress people, and it's not just AOC, questioning the legitimacy of the Supreme Court, and do they have the authority to do what they've done? Yeah, I, I love that she thinks it's a crisis of democracy. She seems to have forgotten that she's in the democratically elected branch. <laughs> the Supreme Court is not. And what they've actually done here is give it back to democracy. Mm -hmm. what, what happens when people read rights into the Constitution and aren't there is they're taking things out of the democratic process mm -hmm. itself. And so this is actually a triumph for democracy and the rule of law. But maybe, maybe AOC missed that, that section in civic class. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, well, she, it's a good time for a refresher. AOC was also asked about the statements made by Senators Manchin and Collins, who feel that they were misled by Supreme Court Justices Gorsuch and Kavanaugh during their confirmation hearings regarding Roe and the president. Here's what she had to say. If we allow Supreme Court nominees to lie under, earth, under oath and secure lifetime appointments to the highest court of the land, there must be consequences for such a deeply destabilizing action and hostile takeover of our democratic institutions. I believe lying under oath is an impeachable offense. Um, I believe that violating federal law in not disclosing income from political organizations, as Clarence Thomas uh, mm -hmm. did years ago, is also potentially an impeachable offense. An impeachable offense. Carrie, your reaction to all of this? You know, if she wants to impeach those judges, she should look at impeaching some of the liberal judges who also said things that then they voted differently. Justice Kagan, who said in her hearings, there is no federal constitutional right to same-sex marriage, later got in the court and voted to create a constitutional mm -hmm. right to same-sex marriage. Senator or, or Justice Sotomayor, who said uh, that, that she understood that the precedents were that there's an individual right to bear arms, and then she went in the court and voted the opposite direction. So, you know, we know that they can, they can describe in their hearings what mm -hmm. the state of the law is, but none of them uh, on, on either side of the aisle can promise how they're going to vote in cases. They didn't do that, and she's just trying to find ways to uh, to really name call here, uh, but it, it, it has no, no relation to what they actually said in their hearings. Yeah, no, the, the, the depiction of this as somehow a breach of democracy or a, a rupturing of our system it's it's breathtaking. No one no one said this when Argerfeld came down and, and same-sex marriage was uh, allowed suddenly. That was overnight by the court. I mean, we have to say that. Overturning a bunch of state laws. Yeah, right? over, overruling state law. Nobody said that the Supreme Court is illicit or not legitimate or we have to stake out the houses of Congress, uh, I mean, of, of justices. And yet, we're seeing this pressure now. Um, related to that, Susan, since that leaked draft of that opinion came out, we have seen crisis pregnancy centers targeted by fire and vandalism throughout the country, 21 cases so far. You have a center in D.C., one similar to yours was uh, attacked here on Capitol Hill. How are you dealing with the security at the facility? And uh, has federal law enforcement or local law enforcement been in touch about the security of not only your staff, but these very vulnerable clients you deal with every day? 
So we have increased security, we have added cameras, and I've been very pleased with Homeland's response and the local district police in D.C. They've been phenomenal. They have reached out to us, they have been on our block every day since Friday, except for today, mm. and been there. So just that presence, especially because we have the maternity home, I yeah. was even more worried for the women who lived there, mm -hmm. but they have been really wonderful, and I appreciate that. Well, that's good to hear. I mean, and surprising, frankly, because that's not the case cross-country, so it's good D.C. is engaged. Uh, Carrie, we've also seen the attacks on churches being vandalized. Uh, just in the past several weeks, uh, in Virginia, graffiti was sprayed all over the walls of a church. Statues of a church in Buffalo, New York, were smashed. That historic St. Coleman Catholic Church in West Virginia burned to the ground. Arson is suspected. Are you surprised we're not hearing more about these acts of violence and pressure being applied? I mean, why are we hearing nothing about this aside from few outlets? Yeah, I mean, it, it is a rash of incidents, and they're and they're coordinated. I mean, there's right. this group, Jane's Revenge, which mm -hmm. has uh, Antifa connections, has been advocating for these things as well as Ruth sent us another another mm -hmm. group. These pop up kind of attack groups. What sh should be you know, happening here is this actually is a violation of federal law, the FACE Act, that, that people are most familiar with because it protects entrance to clinic access, access mm -hmm. uh, like for Planned Parenthood clinics, and it gets rigorously defended in those cases also explicitly applies to churches and should apply to uh, prices pregnancy centers as well because mm -hmm. they're offering pregnancy counseling and that's covered under the act this is a violation of federal law yeah. arguably a hate crime it, it, it's a real it should be should be dealt with uh, Susan, seriously do you and other crisis pregnancy centers feel vulnerable now I mean do you feel like you're under attack or, or potentially under attack absolutely again it was really scary on Friday and then over the weekend worrying about it Thankfully, again, for the police response and so many people praying for us, mm -hmm. really felt that protected. But yeah, it's definitely a vulnerability yeah. that we've never felt before. And these are, people should understand, these are mostly volunteer organizations that use every penny to feed the ladies living with them and their children, help with the maternity care, help to house them. Now they're having to pay for security 24-7. And I know that from across the country. I've been getting calls all week about this. Uh, I want to move on very quickly, Carrie. We keep hearing, and I'm going to talk about it with Congressman Chris Smith in a moment, uh, Nancy Pelosi, today the president, said we need to codify Roe v. Wade into law. J just, I mean, look, you, you were a clerk on the Supreme Court. Will that withstand judicial review? Can the Congress, does it have the capability of creating a federal right to something like abortion that we just said is in the hands of the states? Yeah, well, there are so many problems with this idea, starting with the fact that they don't even have the votes to do it. They would have to override the filibuster, mm -hmm. and even last time they tried to do it, partly because they overreached so far. They didn't just try to codify Roe. They tried to eliminate conscience rights, eliminate parental notification, all these, all these kind of wish lists mm -hmm. of the big Planned Parenthoods of the world. But there's a real question. I mean, remember with the Obamacare case, and they said, well, the Commerce Clause, anything that affects commerce, basically we can do. I suspect that would probably be their argument again this time, and uh -huh. we know how successful that was, even though John Roberts found a way to uphold Obamacare. His his vote was recognizing that the Commerce Clause doesn't mean that Congress just has a, a blank check to to do whatever they want that affect, mm -hmm. might affect commerce. So I think there'd be real questions on every level yeah. to that kind of proposal. Now, I've talked to a number of constitutional scholars who who think they don't. They simply Congress simply doesn't have. They can enforce a right, but they don't have the the the, the duty to create one. And that is what they would be doing here. Carrie, I want to move on to this notion that. Uh, the Supreme Court overreached its authority here. And many in the media are citing Clarence Thomas's concurrence, where he says, not only is this right to privacy wrong, we need to look at everything that proceeded from it. Everything from contraception to gay marriage should be looked at. Sam Alito, in his opinion, said, no, we're not going any further than abortion. Well, which is it? Well, actually, Justice Thomas joined Alito's opinion in full. So the, this decision doesn't touch those things. And what, mm -hmm. what Justice Thomas is writing separately to say is, hey, I agree, this decision doesn't go there, but here's a real problem with this substantive due process, which is this notion that something that's inherently procedural, that is due process, mm -hmm. somehow confers substantive rights. And that the court has used that historically to create rights to a whole range of things, not just contraception and same-sex marriage, but also things like uh, the, the Dred Scott decision, mm -hmm. creating a right to own another human being in slavery. I mean, so there was a whole lot of bad things that have flowed from it. And he said that doesn't mean that any of these rights they've tried to find through that are necessarily illegitimate, but that clearly isn't where they come from. No. We need to re-examine them all. Susan, before we run out of time, there have been reports in Time magazine and other places that 
since the HIPAA rules, the privacy rule, does not apply to crisis pregnancy centers, that those centers might share people's personal information with groups looking to investigate a person or share private information with groups that would uh, discourage a person from getting an abortion, for instance. Crisis pregnancy centers are being depicted by Planned Parenthood as, quote, sites operated by anti-abortion activists that work to guide women to abortion alternatives in the guise of providing health care. What do you make of those accusations? I think they're totally false. I think we are portrayed wrong. I think that most or all crisis pregnancy centers work out of love. It's love for those on the margins, and that love is not to get them in trouble, to use any type of coercion. It's to supply them, to connect them to health care, to make sure that they have resources, mm -hmm. and to walk alongside of them. So I think those are just baseless. Mm -hmm. Carrie, before we're out of time, uh, this landmark decision was leaked early. Mm -hmm. John Roberts is supposedly investigating. Where are we, and why haven't the, the, the leakers or leaker been revealed. Yeah, I think a lot of people were maybe wishfully thinking, maybe he already found the person and after the term was done or after the case came down, he was going to announce it. Well, it's, the, the term is now officially over and there has been no announcement. And mm -hmm. the clerks generally will start leaving starting the first week of July. So it seems to me that unfortunately we've seen he has not been able to follow through on that. That is really uh, worrisome because if we saw one major case leaked this term mm -hmm. in a historic way, we might see, you know, multiple ones next term. There's been no yeah. consequences, and that, that's really yeah. a sad moment for the court as an institution. Well, you know better than I in Washington, when you start monkeying around with the rules, lowering vote counts, blowing out filibusters for certain issues, it becomes epidemic, and the other party uses it next time around. Mm -hmm. I fear this is going to be the future of every major Supreme Court decision. Leaks and pressure campaigns before they're announced. Now, that's, that's ruinous. Talk about an insurrection on a branch right. of government. That, this would be it. Carrie and Susan, thank you both for being here. Thanks. For the legislative perspective, I want to go now to U.S. Congressman from New Jersey, co-chair of the House Pro-Life Caucus, Congressman Chris Smith. Thank you. Delighted to be back on set Good to see you again. Great to see you. Thank you. Uh, Congressman Smith, <clears throat> President Biden just announced that he now supports that filibuster in uh, getting rid of the filibuster in Congress in order to pass legislation establishing a national right to abortion. Here's what he had to say. I believe we have to codify Roe v. Wade in the law, and the way to do that is to make sure the Congress votes to do that. And if the filibuster gets in the way, it's like voting rights require an exception to the filibuster for this action. Now, Congressman, Nancy Pelosi has tried this twice and failed to get the votes. Um, is this just grandstanding in an election Well, it's year? grandstanding, but we have to be very aware that if Joe Manchin were to flip, and, you know, he's been pro-life mm -hmm. uh, and embraces Roe versus Wade, which is abortion on demand right till birth, mm -hmm. uh, I hope he knows that then everyone who votes for that are directly responsible uh, for an expansion of abortion in this country, and every abortion, at least in part, will be attributable to their work, their vote. Uh, so there's direct responsibility now. We can't say, oh, the court made us do it. The court has now said, lawmakers, it's up to you. Mm -hmm. and, and, I'm, I'm, and with Biden saying, you know, Biden has become the abortion president. You know, when he first ran, we thought, well, he's with us on the Hyde Amendment. Yeah. Then he did an infamous flip-flop on that. Mm -hmm. uh, and now he is just 1,000% domestically and internationally promoting abortion. It was at the G7. He pr promotes it at the World Health Organization, at the United Nations, everywhere, and especially here in the United States. Well, and there's a double-edged sword that the, uh, you would think both parties <clears throat> would have recognized at this point. Blowing up the filibuster is always a bad idea sure. because yeah. guess what? You will be out of power someday. That's right. And you'll need that filibuster to balance things out and to have some say in the debate. Well, th they both seem heedless of that right now. But House Democrats uh, seem willing to risk it. And here's my question. Assuming the Republicans maintain or gain <clears throat> rule of Congress next season, what are they going to do? Well, right now we're still in defensive mode because we don't have enough votes to overcome a veto by the, the abortion president, Joe Biden. Uh, but we will have the power of the purse so we can make sure that those accounts 
that are aiding and abetting Planned Parenthood, which is now directly mm -hmm. responsible for over 8 million dead unborn babies, and other groups like that, uh, we could look at that area, make sure that all the riders, like the Hyde Amendment, the amendment that I did on federal employees' health benefits, ban on abortion, mm -hmm. that's 8 million people and dependents that are, you know, if he switches that, uh, yeah. They are now paying for abortion on demand. Well, now so you have talk of, from Elizabeth conscience. Warren and others right. saying, we need to have abortion tents at national oh, parks. You could do it at military <clears throat> bases so that you would have outposts of abortion on federal lands. I hope the American people take a really good look at all of this because, you know, and, and men and women of faith will realize that who you vote for absolutely matters. These people have an agenda that say that the unborn child is so much garbage and can be killed on demand right up until birth, and some even suggest even after birth. And that's why the Born Alive Act needs to be enacted. Uh, there's there's a, an obsession with taking the lives of unborn children. And we need to say, love them both. Help the mother, help the baby. Pregnancy care centers are being firebombed and, and vandalized and terrorized as we talk. Uh, where Where is Biden on that? Hmm. Nothing. Yeah. His attorney general has, you know, crickets. He ought to be out there saying no violence. Anybody who does this will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. He's doing yeah. nothing like that. I have to shift gears. The Democrats are urging <clears throat> the president to declare abortion a national health emergency. Is there any credibility to that? Does that cure anything, if you will, and open up abortion to a federal right? No, it doesn't. And, and matter of fact, it's part of a a horrible knee-jerk reaction by the pro-abortionists to the Dobbs case. You know, Justice Alito wrote a brilliant, brilliant uh, brief mm -hmm. and concurred in by the majority. Uh, he's from my hometown originally, mm -hmm. so we're all very, very proud mm -hmm. of him. Uh, he, he's brilliant, but he's also unbelievably ethical and a man of, mm -hmm. of, of humility. I mean, he's yeah. not, a, not a braggart in any way, shape, or form. He's written a great piece. Now, the other side is trying to say, uh, you know, they're just being obsessed. I mean, including S Senator Warren. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I saw her really lose it even before when, when the leaked version right. came out. Uh, these are babies. You know, ultrasound has shattered the myth mm -hmm. that, 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 that there's not a baby there. We know there's a baby there. Birth is an event that happens to each and every one of us. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not the beginning of life. Why is it okay to dismember, to behead? That's what decapitation abortions do. It mm -hmm. beheads the child takes their head off. Yeah. I think that is barbaric. Mm -hmm. And we got to start calling it for what it is. Mm -hmm. They just sidestep it, look the other way, and act as if it's not happening, and it hurts women. There was a national meeting uh, the other night. It was, was a web it. webinar. You were there. Uh, life uh, after Roe. Yes. What happened there? What are you hearing <clears throat> from these, not only activists, but people who have been on the front lines of caring for mothers and their children all over this nation for 49 years. Oh, they've been amazing. The, the crisis pregnancy centers, for example, uh, well, approximately 3,000 of them, and, and they'll need to grow mm -hmm. uh, and expand their capability, which is a good thing, a great challenge. Mm -hmm. But many of them spoke, uh, and they were articulate and as compassionate as the day is long. They love them both. And once the baby is born, they're still there backstopping, helping that woman in any way, shape, or form uh, through an unintended pregnancy. So it's, it's, um, that's the loving response. Uh, the, the terrible response is to say, just kill the baby, because uh, that injures both mother and baby. Yeah. So, uh, and, and a lot of them spoke about you know, how legally, legislatively, voting-wise, you know, people have to make sure they vote in this election. Mm. Uh, and, you know, people of conscience mm -hmm. uh, don't just say, oh, it's going to happen. The Republicans may take control of the House or Senate or both. It only happens mm. if we make it happen with the grace of God mm. because we've got to put a tourniquet on this abortion culture. I have to get your take on some news that broke earlier this week. Nancy Pelosi met with Pope Francis yeah. on July 29th. <clears throat> uh, not only that, she attended a papal mass where she received communion. Now, the speaker, as we've reported for weeks, has been denied communion by her archbishop, Salvatore Cordelioni, in her home diocese of San Francisco. And he did so for her persistent and public support of abortion on demand. What message does this send the faithful and the bishops to have the, the speaker of the house who supports something so at odds with church teaching welcomed and feted at the Vatican. Well, my hope is that the Pope said something to her one-on-one. -on -one. I don't know mm -hmm. that. But if he did, he ought to let us know that. It is important, even with someone with whom you are diametrically opposed, 
uh, to speak truth to power. Mm -hmm. And I hope he did that. Uh, and there's different ways of pastoring. Uh, mm -hmm. My hope is that, that the Speaker of the House and others uh, will rethink their own position. You know, we pray for our opponents. We love those who are persecuting unborn children. Uh, you know, it's the beauty of this movement. It's the beauty of our church. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think we need to radiate. You know, one of the things, if you're going to radiate Christ, which is obviously what the Pope mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. our bishops do, uh, they also have to speak truth to power and, yeah. and to be totally, and I mean totally, transparent about it. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, if I'm just John Q. Public and I have, I'm for abortion, Okay, what does that really do? Maybe my vote is the wrong way yeah. in the next election. But when you're in Congress in a strategic position, it goes for the courts too, yeah. where what you do enables, funds, empowers the abortionists to kill babies, uh, it's a whole level of responsibility yeah. uh, that can't be overlooked. And I, I read the papers, they're always saying, uh, you know, she, it's because of her position. Uh, or any of the others. Mm -hmm. It's not just their position, it's their outright advocacy mm -hmm. of something that leads to the direct consequence of mm -hmm. dead babies. I I'm going to take a slightly different tact on this, just watching this from a media perspective. <clears throat> There's no doubt this was a deliberate and staged meeting at the Vatican, and I think it was intended to send a message. Look, Nancy Pelosi didn't scalp those tickets, Chris Smith. You can't buy those tickets. Someone gave them to her and placed her in near the front of the church, within view of the cameras. This was, and the, the papal meeting was clearly orchestrated. After all these years of struggle, as a pro-life Catholic, yeah, yeah. how did you receive this when you saw this happen? Well, I felt a sense of disappointment. Um, mm -hmm. You know, John Paul II would meet with anyone and everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the uh, um, Cardinal uh, O'Connor, mm -hmm. I'll never forget something that Cardinal O'Connor told me that Senator Moynihan wanted to always get the picture at, at the cathedral in New York City. And, and uh, he said, I'll meet with you anytime and talk, but to get the picture, you gotta be pro-life. Oh, wow. Cardinal Connor told me that. Well, consistency, and I think no matter where you are on this issue, being who you say you are is an important thing, that authenticity. Sure There's a lot of talk now about court packing, uh, yeah. uh, Congressman, uh, and, and expanding the number of justices on the court. Do you think that's possible, legitimate, or, or even in the offing? It's certainly not legitimate, and I think it's, it's, it's um, I mean, court packing who can go both ways, as right. you know. You know, yep. we think we'll take control of one or both houses. Uh, I just think it's a sign of weakness on the part of the other side, mm. uh, and, and, and very unfortunate. You know, they don't play by the rules. Mm -hmm. And we have all these years, you know, we've been disappointed. Three out of five of the justices appointed by Ronald Reagan and mm -hmm. George Herbert Walker Bush turned out to be pro-abortion. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about disappointment when, when you know, mm -hmm. the, uh, the Casey decision was handed down and Sandra Day O'Connor created a brand new burden to protecting life called the undue burden. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, you know, was used to knock down a lot of state laws, state laws that, that yeah. were put up. Uh, so we've had disappointment. Uh, but I don't think it's going to prevail. You know, FDR tried it. Yeah. I don't think it's going to happen, and uh, I don't think they'll have the votes for it. Mm. Just like on the filibuster, yeah. I would hope, you know, that will be well. You can't just isolate and say for one issue the filibuster will right. be null and void. Yeah. Once it's gone, it's, it's gone. gone on everything. Right. Because when, when Mitch McConnell gets back into power, he'll say, well, I've decided to suspend it for That's taxes right. and right. for this. I mean, it, it you, Pandora's you are, box wheel. you're unleashing theories in the institution and demolishing that institution. That's true. And I, I pray we don't go down this road in either party. It's horrible. Right. It's bad for the republic, and it's bad for every citizen of the country. And, Raymond, several of my bills uh, have been held up including three times passing no taxpayer funding for abortion, mm. making it a permit to take an abortion out of Obamacare, mm. which they lied and say it was not in it. It's in it big time. I got it passed three times in the House. Bipartisan bill, but it was my bill. It goes over to the Senate, it's gone. Without mm. the filibuster, we will get it. And, and many other pieces of legislation. Mm. Mm. Congressman Chris Smith, thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Raymond. <laughs> On Monday, the Supreme Court ruled that a school board in Washington state violated the First Amendment rights of a high school football coach when he lost his job for praying at the 50-yard line after games. He's joined us before, and I'm thrilled that he's back, to discuss his case, former football coach of Bremerton High School, Joseph Kennedy, and special counsel for litigation and communications at the First Liberty, uh, representing Coach Joe, Jeremy Dice. 
Chance, thanks for being here. Coach Joe, you served as an assistant coach uh, at Bremerton from 2008 to 2015, and you made a promise to God that win or lose, you'd always offer a prayer of thanks after every game. You prayed on the field. Um, for this, the school fired you. Do you feel vindicated now that the Supreme Court has ruled six to three, saying that your prayer is not only protected by the Constitution's guarantee of free speech, but religious exercise? Absolutely. It's the biggest sigh of relief because seven years is a long time. We're going into our eighth football season. Hmm. So you can imagine going through all the court systems and hearing you lose, you lose, you lose over and over again. Hmm. And you almost start thinking, maybe I, I, maybe I did do something wrong. You know, you hmm. get the doubts in your mind. But as soon as that came down from the Supreme Court, it's like, Oh, man, it's perfect. Uh, I did nothing wrong. I did exactly what the Constitution says. Mm -hmm. And, man, that's a, that's a great day and a great feeling. Any reaction from the players, your former players or members of the community? What are you hearing? Oh, yes. My Facebook and my Instagram, of course, blew up like crazy. Uh, I haven't even been able to keep up with it. My phone has not stopped buzzing mm -hmm. since this all happened. And, yeah, so I've talked to a bunch of my players, former coaches, some of the people that I used to work with back at the school. So a whole lot of support and a lot of partying going on in Bremerton. Uh, Jeremy, uh, Justice Neil Gorsuch wrote the majority opinion, and he wrote this, respect for religious expressions is indispensable to life in a free and diverse republic. Whether those expressions take place in a sanctuary or a field, and whether they manifest through the spoken word or a bowed head, here, a government entity sought to punish an individual for engaging in a brief, quiet, personal religious observance doubly protected by the Constitution. What effect, Jeremy, do you think this case will have on similar cases involving public displays of prayer or religious expression in the school setting? Well, my hope is that, number one, they, they adhere to what Justice Gorsuch said here and turn towards respecting religious expressions rather than disrespecting them. It seems the default attitude for most school districts in the country is when and if religion pops up on a school campus, they immediately invoke the Establishment Clause as a way to drive it off campus here. And hmm. Justice Gorsuch is exactly right. When we show respect for religion on campus and throughout our society, it only strengthens our republic, and especially on school campuses. Hmm. You know, we, we had a question mark about whether or not the schoolhouse gates remained open to constitutional rights for teachers and coaches on their campus here. But Justice Gorsuch reminds us that uh, we actually are at our most inclusive, our most diverse, our most free when we welcome yeah. coaches and teachers to carry their constitutional rights through the schoolhouse gates. No longer must they surrender them before they walk into the school doors. Mm. And that can only mean great things for our freedom. On ABC's The View this week, uh, that legal scholar Sarah Hines had this to say about praying on the 50-yard line. Listen. My problem with it is it feels performative. Prayer is usually private. And when you pray, if this were a Muslim, he would private, or he, she would be privately praying to me. It's the problem is you're on the center field. It was not, it was not brief and it was audible. He would pray outwardly. <laughs> Coach, your reaction, uh, was this performative on your part? Was it just to be seen? No, and, and I find that very humorous because they're talking about different time frames throughout um, the eight years that I coached. Yeah, it was out loud and it was in the center of the field, but it went unknown by the school district, supposedly, mm. for eight years. So yeah. nobody knew I was doing this until they got a hold of it and made it go crazy. Yeah, and, and she obviously, in her in her Bahama resort with her sunglasses sitting between Whoopi and Joy Behar, she apparently has never been to a town where Muslims live because if she traveled to the places I have uh, throughout the Middle East, uh, here in the United States, in Disney World recently, Muslims regularly bow down and pray in public, and no one says it's performative, nor does anyone have a problem with it. So uh, exactly. following the Supreme Court decision... Um, Following the Supreme Court decision, a former parent, Paul Peterson, who had four children attending uh, Bremerton High School, wrote an op-ed for NBC regarding this case. He wrote, quote, teenagers see coaches as authority figures who determine playing time and influence how well they interact with the rest of their teammates, their friends. When Kennedy met with the entire team on the field immediately following games, with the community watching, it would have been incredibly hard for a teenager, any teenager, to refuse to participate. 
even if Kennedy's prayers conflicted with the students' personal religious beliefs. It's not the job of coaches or teachers to lead school children in prayer or coerce them, either explicitly or implicitly, to join in religious activities. Coach, your response. Do you think you've, you uh, pressured these kids in any way, or they felt pressured to join your prayers? And that's the funny thing, because I, I used to be friends with Paul when I actually coached his son, and nobody has once even asked him. And I said, Paul, why, why di didn't you come to me if this was a problem when I coached your kid for the four years? There was never a problem. But to answer the question, moreover, is that the school district, they did a complete investigation. I challenged everybody in the news media, the local, everywhere find at least one kid that that felt pressured into it just find one you mm -hmm. know but the but the cool thing is is the and they got their time frames a little bit wrong too i was fired when i stopped praying with the team because mm -hmm. it became a problem and i was doing it by myself alone at right. the center of the field and so it removed all of those concerns that he supposedly had Hmm. Jeremy, Justice uh, Sonia Sotomayor wrote in the dissent, the majority elevates one individual's interest in personal religious exercise to the extent, to the, in the exact time and place of that individual's choosing over the society's interest in protecting the separation between church and state, eroding the protections for religious liberty for all. Uh, Jeremy, does that decision in any way erode religious liberty protections? And what is this separation of church and state? What's that really about? Well, that concept, those words, as you know, are not in the Constitution right. at all. But let's take the concept for a second about separation of church and state. That's meant to, uh, to protect against two different institutions, the church and the state. Well, here we just have an individual going up against a gigantic institution in the state, and the power of the state rained down heavily upon Coach Kennedy. Mm. Uh, the power of the state fired Coach Kennedy for daring to exercise what are otherwise protected rights under the Constitution. In other words, what the, the justices said on Monday is that the Free Exercise Clause acted as, as, as precisely as it was supposed to. It protected Coach Kennedy against mm. the overbearing power of the government to fire mm. him and to force him into submission, to, to censor him and to abuse his civil rights. So the only institution that engaged in any improper behavior, the court said, is the school district here. They engaged in religious discrimination. They violated his free exercise rights under the First Amendment. They violated his free speech rights under the First Amendment. So they violated the First Amendment twice. And mm -hmm. then they uh, took away his, his job uh, under religious reasons. So that's a violation yeah. of his civil rights as well. So for a school district to, to use the heavy power that they have under the form of government that, that, that we give them to abuse a singular citizen, little old Joe Kennedy, that's a, that's a tremendous travesty yeah. here. And, and why a justice of the Supreme Court would be upset that the free exercise clause actually protected a citizen is beyond me. Coach, I'm going to give you the final word. Are you surprised that you were singled out here when... In today's schools all across the country, we have all manner of people coming in and coercing. I think it would, it's an obvious case of coercion. They're bringing on to coerce kids to a viewpoint or a lifestyle or a different way of thinking that may not comport with either the educational curricula or the parents' intentions. Yeah, I, I see that every day, you know, especially at Bremerton. It's a, such a diverse and, and supposedly inclusive, but they're cramming all of those things into one thing. And I was just trying to take a knee and thanking God after a football game. It was something mm -hmm. I did by myself. It wasn't even supposed to be with anybody. So I'm glad that I went back to that practice. And that's all I'm looking for when I get back. Well, thanks for being here, both of you, Coach Joseph Kennedy, Jeremy Dice. We wish you the best and uh, congratulations on the way the court ruled in your case. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. China continues its genocide and repression of predominantly Muslim Uyghurs and other religious minority groups. PRC continues to harass adherents of other religions that it deems out of line with Chinese Communist Party doctrine, including by destroying Buddhist, Christian, Islamic, and Taoist houses of worship, and by erecting barriers to employment and housing for Christians, Muslims, Tibetan Buddhists, and Falun Gong practitioners. That was U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken earlier this month at the State Department when it issued its annual report on international religious freedom. Here with reaction is the former ambassador at large
for International Religious Freedom, Sam Brownback, and he joins us from the International Religious Freedom Summit, which he's hosting this week here in Washington, D.C. Sam, thanks for making the time. Uh, you just heard the Secretary of State's comments there on religion in China. China still remains on the countries of particular concern list. But what does that really mean at this point? Well, it doesn't mean enough because you're not seeing China change its tactics. Mm -hmm. I, and we've got to start adding economic sanctions on these, uh, Raymond. If we don't do that, if, it, if there aren't teeth with it, if there isn't a bite, it's just another set of words, and the Chinese will just say, ah, oh, it doesn't really mean anything, or it's just some sort of Western imperialism, or it's the Americans trying to hold us down, none of which is true. They are horrible on religious freedom. They are expanding religious persecution around the world, and they're inventing new techniques and high-tech ones to oppress people. They're the future of oppression. It's unbelievable. Uh, will they ever be held accountable, Sam, for the atrocities against religious minorities, particularly the Christians and the Uyghur Muslims and uh, freedom fighters who are happen to be Catholic, like Jimmy Lai? Yeah, Jimmy. Well, and what about arresting the Cardinal of Hong Kong? Right. You know, it, it, that Cardinal Zen, that, that is really an unbelievable, an 80 year old cardinal that you're arresting. I, I fear that near term they won't be held accountable, but they need to, and we need to make a big case out of this because they also enable human rights abuses around the world. So anybody else that's a human rights mm -hmm. abuser, China will and welcome into their economy. Look what they did to Russia to back Russia in the Ukrainian invasion. The Chinese were the puppet master behind the Russians on this. Yep. You're absolutely right. We'll be talking in a bit to Nigerian Bishop Jude Aro Gundade. Uh, in our next segment about that terrible situation in his country. But as you know, Nigeria was removed from the list of countries of particular concern last year, which is puzzling considering the number of terrorist attacks against Christians there, uh, Ambassador. Uh, a State Department official met with Bishop Jude recently. Your thoughts on this, and was there anything new in that recent report addressing the crisis in Nigeria? Well, it is a crisis. They deserve to be on the list as a country of particular concern. They deserve economic sanctions for what's taking place. And until you really press the Nigerian government on this, they are not going to protect their own community. And you're going to see more of this killing. You saw two priests killed this last right. weekend. You saw 41 Catholics in this one church were slaughtered and gunned down on a Sunday. That's going to continue to happen unless you really press the Nigerian government. They need to be a CPC country, and there needs to be economic sanctions associated with that towards mm. Nigeria. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Secretary Blinken singled out China, Burma, Myanmar, uh, Eritrea, Pakistan, Afghanistan, India as countries exhibiting significant problems regarding religious freedom. What are you hearing on the ground at this year's summit? That those problems are significant, they're real, and they're happening. I even met with a group of Sikhs in, from India and the Pakistan area, and they're getting persecuted in India, and that's where wow. they originally came from. And you're, you're really hearing it on a broad cross-section of people. The Christians are, uh, if you've got a Christian missionary group, a number of them are getting kicked out of uh, India. You saw Mother Teresa's organization in India was originally, they took their bank account away. Now they've reinstated it after international pressure. But mm -hmm. Mother Teresa of Calcutta, uh, you're, you're cutting her bank account out so she can't take care of the poor. I, I, I really don't understand why the Modi government is doing this so hard on, on and this is a place, India has been a subcontinent for years, has been very um, fair towards other people right. of other faiths. They have four major religions came out of the Indian subcontinent itself. So they've been really good about it, but this Hindu nationalism has really taken a hard edge the wrong way, I think. But, but Ambassador, this is a prime example of uh, a, a situation where the United States could exert real pressure and have a positive result. Why aren't we insisting on human and religious rights in places like India? That's a major trading partner with the United States. You know, I, I really think it's because of our focus on China. And I'm, I mm. am for us focusing on China. And mm -hmm. we're saying, you know, India is our major counterweight that we're supporting. But you, you don't give your friends just a pass on human rights just because they're an ally of yours. That's a long-term recipe, I think, for a, a really 
poor, imbalanced mm -hmm. relationship. I think we have to go to India and say, yes, we want to work with you against China, and yes, you have to stand for religious mm -hmm. freedom and human rights. You're a democracy like we're a democracy. Right. You have to stand for these things, and I, I think, honestly, you can play that tension, and there's some tension with it, <laughs> but I think we have to, to be true to ourselves mm -hmm. and really true to leading the world on human rights, which the United States always has. Before we run out of time, uh, I have to get your take on these recent Supreme Court rulings that could affect religious freedom uh, here at home and, and really into the near future. The main school voucher system can no longer exclude funding for religious schools. And our earlier guest, Coach Joe Kennedy, scored a victory for this sideline prayer following yes. uh, public high school uh, football games in Washington State. How important were these rulings vis-a-vis -vis freedom I, of I, speech and religion here in the United States? I think they were critical. You, you're finally seeing the pendulum start to move back just a little bit on the free exercise clause. Before, the court always just looked at the establishment clause and said, oh, it's the establishment clause, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. Now they're saying, well, wait, there's a free exercise part of this. You can freely exercise, and that was the win in Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And this one on the main school case, uh, I, I think really one of the key things we have to do in the future is allow children to pick the school, children, I'm saying K-12 and their, yep. their parents, pick the school and have the money follow the child, which that case helps open us up a route to be able to do that, which would be critically mm -hmm. important to the future of this country. Yeah, well, we will leave it there. Mr. Ambassador, I thank you. To find out more on the International Religious Freedom Summit, visit irfsummit.org. Sam, thank you. Now to an important story we've been covering for weeks now, really for years. In Nigeria, currently, millions of Christians are being targeted for merely practicing their faith. This became horribly clear on Pentecost Sunday when Islamic extremists murdered 40 worshipers at Mass. My next guest has called it a religious cleansing, and as we reported last week, some have blamed climate change for the slaughter. Joining me now with an update is the shepherd of the Onda Diocese, Bishop Jude Arogundade. Bishop Jude, thank you for being here. Um, Your Excellency, uh, there has been an investigation into who's responsible for this attack earlier this month on St. Francis Catholic Church. Um, are, are, have there been any findings? Has anyone reached out to you with uh, what they've discovered? Well, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Please. Uh, the, the federal government that controls the police have not uh, even uh, reached out to us in any form or shape, mm. uh, except that the, the vice president visited the scene of the, of the attack mm. and also went to St. Louis Hospital in Owo to visit uh, the victims. Mm -hmm. and also to the Federal Medical Center, also to commiserate with the victims. As for publicly identifying who these people are, uh, from our own uh, understanding, we know uh, this kind of attack has always been carried out by the Fulani headsmen, the militant Fulani headsmen mm -hmm. who have been attacking uh, uh, communities and Christians across Nigeria and uh, mm. seeking for, to take over lands and uh, to uh, dominate the different communities in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Bishop, who is organizing those Fulani herdsmen and who has radicalized them? I mean, someone is behind them. Certainly somebody is behind them. The government have refused to name those who are the sponsors and those who are arming these Fulani men and women, and mm -hmm. sometimes mm -hmm. children even. Mm -hmm. And they continue to carry out all kinds of atrocity here and there within the country. Yes. And no one has really been arrested and tried and sentenced, and uh, no example have been made. Following the attack, Bishop, on St. Francis Catholic Church, uh, Ireland's president, Michael Higgins, excused the murderers by jihadis by saying these Fulani herdsmen are, quote, pastoral peoples who are among the foremost victims of the consequences of climate change. Uh, you denounced that statement. Uh, explain to people why that analysis may be off. Oh, that analysis is off, off, off the track completely. You see, the attacks took place in the, the, attack took place in the church. 
-hmm. And there's nothing about climate change in the church or whatever. I mean, if you are fighting for climate change, look for other means. But when it comes to the point of people just attacking for no reason in order to take mm. possession, in order to cause the maximum death, mm. that day, those people who came to St. Francis Church came there with the aim of killing everybody. The way they carried out that attack, I thought right. they, were ready, they were just out to, to inflict the maximum right. uh, damage on everything, uh, everybody. But uh, thank God, Many people survived, and uh, yeah. you see, this is the situation. But coming to the issue of climate change, that is completely out of yeah. the point. You yeah. know, the church that was attacked was built by the Irish. Yeah. Right? Oh. It was built by the Irish missionaries. And the first two bishops, the first two bishops of my diocese, of Ondo diocese, were Irish gentlemen. Wow. So, and even some of those killed at that attack were baptized or married by the Irish priests. So hmm. that is why the, 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 the reaction of the president of Ireland meant so much to me. Yeah. And when I saw that, I couldn't just hold myself. I have to write him personally. Yeah. I did a kind of press check, a press uh, release. Yeah. Uh, release, no, God, yeah, press release. No, and well, then, God, uh, God said, bless your boldness, I, uh, Bishop, because it's needed, I think, in this moment. When pe people, I can't even show some of the video Bishop, which has been sent to me over the last few weeks. And the fact that the yeah. State Department removed Nigeria from its list of countries of religious freedom concerns is galling to me. Your reaction to that move, were you stunned that that's happening well, at this moment when the Christian community there is being targeted in a brutal way? Uh, Nigeria, as a nation, should be more worried and should be more actively involved in protecting the lives and properties mm -hmm. of law-abiding citizens. So, and uh, when the name of Nigeria was removed as a country of concern, uh, that became so shocking to us, and we don't know who is behind this and what is going on. And uh, mm. even at this summit, have you reached asking out? the same question. Have, and everybody is, uh, yeah, have you reached out to the State Department to try to talk to them? Um, not directly, but we have uh, contacted some congressmen and women Mm -hmm. And we have uh, made our case, and I think uh, they will have to follow up. And uh, when mm -hmm. uh, the undersecretary came to Nigeria uh, recently, I spoke directly with her. And uh, that, is, that was mm -hmm. uh, uh, Victoria uh, Nolan. Mm -hmm. Nolan. So I spoke mm -hmm. directly with her, and uh, she promised to look into uh, uh, the situation. And uh, okay. that's where we are. And you see... Uh, I know uh, there is a reason for that, but whatever reason is it, is, uh, it may be, mm -hmm. I just want the American government to know that uh, yeah. uh, Christians are being persecuted seriously in yeah. Nigeria. When that attack on St. Francis happened, uh, the Pope issued a statement. He said, uh, we all have to pray for the conversion of those blinded by hatred and violence so that they will choose instead the path of peace and righteousness. Um, is that enough? from the Vatican, I, I, I have to say, I expected a more forceful statement. Well, um, the Vatican at this time have seen more than, uh, more than enough because uh, they have reacted almost, uh, they are reacting to the situation of, of Nigeria almost on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. how, many, how many deaths have they reacted to in the past, in the past one, two years? It, uh, it's mm. just out of control, it's I agree. out of hands. So for 41 people to die, and uh, the government is playing dumb, and nobody is telling us anything, as it has always been, it means that something beyond uh, imagination is happening. And yeah. uh, I just hope the whole world respond to this and begin to ask the obvious question, who is behind this? Yep. Why are they so powerful? Why is the government so powerless? Why is the government so complacent? Why is no one, even the security uh, outfit within the country, why are they not taking serious action against this group of people? Mm -hmm. Why are they not naming, especially naming those who accept that the people know who they are? Hmm. And what is this mystery about uh, people going about killing and uh, destroying lives and properties and yeah. everybody seems to be helpless. I well, mean, this Bishop, is unacceptable in any form or shape. I, I yeah. agree. And if people saw some of the videos that I uh, sadly had to watch and, they, and, and the, 
the communities and the families that you've stood beside as they've lost, lost loved ones, including your priests, uh, they, they, it might arrest their attention. We're sending billions of dollars to Ukraine to stop an invasion. But there's an invasion underway right now in Nigeria, and it's costing many, many lives, and the world needs to take notice. Bishop Jude Aro Gundade, I thank you, uh, of the Onda Diocese in Nigeria. We certainly have you and your people in our prayers, and uh, I hope that I hope the world takes notice and steps in here. Uh, and in well, the meantime, people can help alleviate some of that suffering by visiting Aid to the Church in Need, churchinneed.org. They're doing amazing work in Nigeria now. Thank you, Bishop Jude. Thank you. That is all the time we have for now. Be sure to catch us next week. Until then, we will be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now. Thank you.